I mean, it all started in high school. I was that really awkward kid out. I went through that really awkward gothic stage, <laughs> which I have no idea why, but <laughs> um, throughout my whole high school, I was picked on and bullied and because of my face. I, had, I was mauled by a dog when I was four years old, so I have a Harry Potter scar. <laughs> and everybody always thinks it's a dimple and it's actually where the dog's tooth went in. <laughs> so everybody would always tease me and I just, I don't know, my brain, just the way it kind of took everything is, I don't know what the point is of being here anymore. And um, Throughout high school, I think I had three different attempts to commit suicide. They all failed, all because of my friends. <laughs> They're great friends now, but then I hated them. <laughs> but I tried overdosing a couple of times and I tried to drown myself once and it just never worked. But then I kind of just strived forward, pushed forward, and focused on my studies. And then I was introduced to technical theater, and that's where it all kind of evened out because it was finally, I found my happy place something to keep my mind going at all times to where I didn't have to worry about the outside world. I didn't care what they thought. And I just kind of dove in and found my passion and stuck with it. <laughs> so, I mean, that helped me. And then I think it was in 2009 or 2010. It was on a weekend. My dad went four-wheeling and I remember before he left, he asked me and my mom if we wanted to go with him, and we both said, no, we're just going to sit here and wait for the phone call, because we both just woke up with this really weird feeling. And then we got a phone call saying that he had crashed his four-wheeler, and he broke his back, and he's not moving, and they life flighted him, and they tried this experimental surgery on him where they took like this coil that looks like a hot, like a hot hair curling, and I don't know what they're called. <laughs> but they used that and they basically ground up the bone that was broken and stuffed it inside of it and fused it into his back. And he had to wear like this turtle shell. <laughs> but that's what began his downhill spiral because he started getting addicted to his pain medication. And his pain medication started not working because he took it so much. He would get six month prescriptions of his pain medication. They'd last him maybe two months because just nothing was helping the pain anymore. And we could see kind of him going downhill. His attitude was spiking so much and he'd be happy one second and then just he'd be mad at the world the next second, which drove my mom away basically. And they, in 2010 is when they separated for like a year. And then they got back together and said, let's try and work this out and didn't work. so. In 2013, in July of 2013, they separated again, except for it was a lot harder. And he ended up moving out and he said he wanted to get his own apartment, but I knew with where his mind was, I, di I didn't feel safe with him having an apartment by himself because I knew something was gonna happen. So I sat down, had a conversation with my mom and we both decided it'd be best for me to just go and get an apartment with him, just so he kind of had someone there to talk to. And then three days after we signed our lease, I remember the night before we watched Rocky Horror Picture Show and ate steak. <laughs> and he sent a text message to my mom saying, having a great night with my daughter. I couldn't imagine anything better. And we went to bed and I slept on the floor because my stuff hadn't been moved over yet. And um, then I went, got up and I went to work the next day and all throughout work I just had this gut-wrenching feeling and I was sick all day and I just, I couldn't stop crying and I knew something was wrong, but my work wouldn't let me go home. They said, if you leave, you don't have a job and I have to have a job. So after work, I went home and I packed some stuff in to a U-Haul that I had rented and I said, I'm gonna run home really fast and let the dogs out because they've been inside all day. And I went home and I saw my dad's <coughs> car parked outside and it was backed in, which is really odd for him. And I felt like that was just, something's not right there. 
and I walked inside and anybody who knows my dad knows he doesn't go anywhere without his sunglasses and his sunglasses were sitting on the counter but I just kind of blew it off and said well whatever he had a doctor's appointment that day he was going to get a shot but it was making those shots were making his stomach hurt and I knew it was bothering him so I just figured my uncle Steve could have come and gotten him and he just forgot his sunglasses. He's getting forgetful, just kind of whatever, and blew it off. And then I walked through our kitchen and we have like this dining area that was off to the side that had built-in shelving. And I noticed on the, everything was still in boxes, but on the shelves there was his dog's ashes, a picture of his dog, and then the picture I'd given him for his birthday, which was on July 18th because he passed away a week after his birthday. So I gave him a picture of me and him wearing our life vests from when we went on a cruise, and they made us put them on and do that stupid little drill to make sure we know what lifeboat to go to. And we were both just acting like complete idiots. <laughs> so I put it in a picture frame and wrote him this really long like letter saying how much he means to me and stuff. And he had it all set up like a shrine type thing on the mantle, and I. Just, I was like, okay, I don't know why you didn't set up everything else, but whatever. And I remember going in my bedroom, and I sat down, and I opened my laptop, and it connected to his phone's hotspot. And I thought, I was like, well, that's weird. So I got up, and I went in his room, and I was, like, calling out for him, just asking, like, are you here? Like, where are you? And I couldn't see his phone anywhere, and I was like, okay, well, maybe he's outside walking the dogs because the dogs weren't in the apartment initially. And then I walked out and I went out to the balcony and yelled over just trying to see if he was out there and he didn't answer. And then my neighbors brought the dogs over and said he asked me to take him for a walk. And I was like, well, that's kind of weird that you'd ask a complete stranger to take our dogs for a walk. Um, so I brought the dogs inside and they started pacing back and forth from the door to his closet door in his bedroom to the door and just kept going back and forth and I couldn't get him to calm down so I went back in my room and I sat down I tried to get him to lay down with me I got back on my phone my laptop but it was still bothering me that it was connecting to his hotspot but I couldn't find his phone so I went in the I checked in the bedroom again and <clears throat> I remember looking over at the closet and I could see the light coming through the closet and I knew I just had like this instant, my gut just dropped. And I walked over to the closet and I remember in my head, uh, a week prior, we had found a suicide note that he had written. It was like five pages long, telling my mom how horrible of a person she is, that this is all her fault. The only person he can trust is our friend Tabitha. And that he loved me and don't, at the very bottom in big letters it said don't open the door and that played through my head but I didn't think about it and I opened the door and that's when I found him hanging off of his um, the clothes hanger bar from his work belt and I remember him holding his phone in one hand and his laptop was on the ground and his tablet was on the ground and on the phone was a text message to Tabitha saying, I'm sorry, I can't do it anymore. And I remember slamming the door and just screaming no at the top of my lungs and running around the apartment. And then I went back to the uh, closet and I tried to get him down thinking I could save him and I couldn't. I knew it was too far because his face was already bloated on one side and sagging. I remember running outside and my neighbors were walking up the stairwell holding groceries and I was yelling, help me. And I, they just ignored me and walked up the stairs. So I called 911 and I went out in the hallway or I went down the stairs out and called 911 and my neighbor from Orem is a dispatcher for Pleasant Grove, and he answered the phone. And I explained what was going on, and I couldn't stay on the phone because I couldn't breathe, and I just laid on the ground crying. 
And then I remember after I hung up with 911, immediately my friend Jake, who was the dispatcher, had called me and said, Jess, I just talked to you, what's going on? I told him what's going on, he immediately rushed over. He said, I, I don't know what to do, but I'll be here. And he just sat there on the ground and held me. But after so long, obviously, he had to go back to work. But <laughs> I remember after that, I tried calling my mom four or five times. She didn't answer the phone at all. They just kept going to voicemail. And then I called my little brother, Chris, and he wouldn't answer. So I called his wife. She answered, and I said, Dad's gone. I need to talk to Chris. Dad's gone. She said, she said, oh my God, <laughs> I'm so sorry. And then she hung up and called Chris. And then Chris's mom called and everybody was calling after that point. But I remember also calling Tabby and I said, Tabby, I need you to come over. I'm not gonna tell you what's wrong over the phone, but I need you to come over. And I gave her my address and she said, I'm on my way. And then the cops showed up and obviously they have like the, who are they called? She's like a counselor lady who basically gives you all these stupid brochures that you're never gonna use right at that moment of your situation. And she just sat there and asked me a million questions on how I was feeling. And I, just, I was like, I don't wanna talk right now. I remember looking up the stairs and seeing the paramedic walk out and immediately just made complete eye contact with me and made this movement to me. And I completely lost it. <laughs> because no one wants to see that. You're not supposed to show the person that's going out through that situation that. But then Tabby showed up and she ran up the stairs with her hand on her gun because she had a concealed weapons permit thinking that it was a domestic dispute between me and my dad. And she's, she was ready to defend me in whatever way possible. But as soon as she ran up the stairs and saw me on the ground, she immediately collapsed and almost fell down the stairs because she knew what happened. She just had that feeling. And I mean, that's basically what I replay in my mind every night when I sleep, is that moment of walking in his room and seeing the light and just screaming no constantly. It's an everyday thing. Halloween's really hard for me because everybody thinks that the hanging man is a really amazing decoration and it's not because <laughs> it brings back that kind of stuff and flashbacks and but since then it's kind of been a learning experience but making it through it slowly <laughs> the little things still trigger me <laughs> probably the feeling that you would get the best way to explain it is when you're going through a haunted house and someone jumps out and scares you and you, it takes your breath away and you get that really strong feeling in your chest and your head starts spinning and everybody thinks it's fun, but it's not anymore. <laughs> but I mean, that'd be the best way to explain how it feels or kind of like when you're a kid and you jump in the deep end for the first time and your feet hit the bottom and you immediately get that scared the panic of trying to get to the top because you forgot how deep the water was. That's how I would explain my personal is the deep water. Because once I get into that, like, that funk, it's a downhill spiral until someone can kind of kick me out of it. So it's like me jumping in the deep end and I can't see the bottom. And I just start gasping for air and swimming for the top, trying to just breathe. I just want to breathe and feel something again. So I'm fighting and clawing my way up to the surface, just trying to breathe. That's how I would explain it personally. Uh, flashbacks would be basically when I'm, it happens a lot of times when I'm at work, if someone will say something, it'll kind of trigger things. Or they're talking about, I just had a coworker the other day that was talking about how mean their dad was. And I just wanted to hit him and be like, you'd be happy your dad's still here type thing. So I mean, it brings out the anger because people take for granted what they have right now. I mean, I took it for granted <laughs> and now I hate it. <laughs>
but I mean little things will kind of trigger it like songs will trigger it so if I hear like certain songs it'll make me think of my dad or seeing an article of clothing that he wore because I still have all this stuff I can't let it go yet or um, I, can, I haven't been able to watch Rocky Horror Picture Show <laughs> since he passed away which really sucks because it's like my favorite movie <laughs> I can't watch it without crying because I think of that night and how great it was and how peaceful he was and happy. But, I mean, basically anything, a flashback would basically just be anything that would trigger your mind to replay a moment in your head that you link to that certain person. But, I mean, the night terrors are because of my PTSD, because I was the one that found him. When I'm sleeping and I get in a deep enough sleep, my mind replays that moment. And my boyfriend has to wake me up almost at least once a night because I'm screaming no, or I'm crying, or I'm punching something because I was hitting walls. I was really mad and I was upset because no one would help me. And but he has to kind of wake me up and reassure me that everything's okay so I don't go off the deep end again. <laughs> but it's pretty much what flashbacks and night terrors would be. PTSD, well, it stands for post-traumatic stress disorder. So with that, basically any time you're in any sort of situation that causes a, it's kind of like a trigger almost. So that's one common misconception. Every time someone hears that I have PTSD, they immediately think, oh, so you were in the army? But I, look at me, come on. <laughs> I couldn't stand a chance in the army. <laughs> but they automatically just assume that if you have PTSD, you served in a war because mostly veterans get it. And that's one thing that really bothers people, like in my case, that have dealt with this situation because it's, not it's out of our control but we went through a very traumatic incident that's kind of left a hole and our brains kind of just figure out how to fill that hole but the only thing it can do is put that memory in that hole to plug it basically is how I would assume to kind of word it <laughs> but um, I was diagnosed after my dad passed away I my mom had me go to mandatory um, what are they called? A psychiatrist. I went and saw her psychiatrist at the time. And she said, with my symptoms that I have of the night terrors and flashbacks, um, whenever I get in any sort of situation where it could be similar to the situation I was in, uh, like closed closet doors, I can't have them anymore. So all my closet doors are taken down and I have curtains put in basically now <laughs> so any closed closet doors will trigger me just anything that is relatable to it that's kind of like the symptoms of PTSD um, it's basically your mind reliving that traumatic event that you went through um, she my the psychiatrist tried to put me on like antidepressants and a sleeping aid to help me get through the night without dreaming type thing but I refuse to take pills I'm not a big fan on them in the first place because of everything my dad went through and because through high school I mean I was depressive and suicidal already I don't need to take pills and then heighten that sense again and bring it back up so I don't take anything for it um, my friend Veronica from my suicide support group she did something that's called EDMR therapy, I think. Basically, they have you say what happened, and after you say what happened, they try to, they tell you, think of something good, a good memory to replace it. And it's kind of reprogramming your brain, so when you're in that kind of situation where your brain wants to kind of kick in and go, okay, it's time to panic, or your chest starts feeling tight or anything like that, your brain automatically kicks in and is like, well, but do you remember this one time? <laughs> so 
I've been looking into doing that kind of therapy, but it's pretty pricey and I can't really afford it. <laughs> so I don't do it. <laughs> um, but every second Thursday of the month, I go to IHC here in Provo in the Women's Center and they have the Heart and Soul Suicide Support Group that I go to every month. And then every third Thursday, they have the same group, but it's in the Payson Hospital in the Women's Center. And it's refreshing just to be around people who actually understand, because it's probably the most frustrating thing about ha being in the situation I'm in is everybody going, oh, I completely understand. Oh, I'm sorry, no, you don't. <laughs> You don't get anything that I'm going through type thing. Or they'll say, I lost a, pa a parent to cancer. You're like That's not the same because you knew what the symptoms were. You knew what it was and you got to say goodbye type thing. But we're left with unanswered questions of why, what could I have done to fix this situation? Is there anything I did to cause you to do it? So we're left the rest of our lives with that big question mark over our head of, why <laughs> but I mean other than that that's pretty much what I do I go through is talking to them if I don't have the group and I'm having a moment I usually just text them or call them and they'll sit and talk to me about anything just to kind of wing my mind off of the problem so I personally got it from my mom but when I start feeling like I'm gonna have an episode so <clears throat> like, for example, the other night, me and my boyfriend were watching a movie. Oh, what was it? I think it was The Conjuring. It was on sci-fi or something. I think. No, it was Sinister. That's what it was. And right at the beginning of the movie, it shows the family being hung from a tree. And immediately after I watched that, my chest got tight, and I started having a hard time breathing. Then... I get that annoying little feeling right here in your nose when you know you're going to start crying and it stings. <laughs> and I'm just, I stood up and I, had to, I go and clean. That's my thing. If I'm really mad or I need to distract myself, I'll usually put on the most stupid happy music I can find in my playlist and then I'll start cleaning <laughs> and just go from there, basically. <laughs> um, but usually... The way I cope with it is just staying away from anything that will trigger me right now. I'm still pretty, like, new to the whole situation because, I mean, I'm only four years in. My friend, I believe it's my friend Amanda, she's 12 years in and she still has a hard time. So it's, I guess everybody has their own roller coaster is what we call it, of grief that you go through and you heal differently. So it's, you can't really compare it to someone else, but you can kind of take from what they do or what they've learned or what they've said to kind of cope with it and go from there and make your own path type thing. But there's really nothing. I mean, as far as like an advice to someone dealing with the issue, probably don't close yourself off. Be open to talking to people find resources that are willing to help you that have people that understand what you're going through because I know that's what helped me and my mom the most is a week after it happened we went to a suicide support group and everybody was really surprised to see us there but me and her both knew that's what we had to do we had to find someone to talk to because nobody understands but people who've actually been through the situation I'd say just be there to comfort them don't try to relate to their problems because you can't relate unless you've actually been in their shoes. But if you haven't been through it, just kind of be there, listen if they need to talk. Cause, I mean, that's what my boyfriend does. Sometimes I just need to tell him about what happened that day and get it out so it's not in my head again. So he kind of understands. And I, he's heard the story so many times, but he'll listen to it over and over again if he has to, because he knows it helps me. And I know like with my little brother, the way he helps me is if whenever I'm going over to his house or um, for example, like my stuff was still at the apartment a few days after it happened. 
and I had to get the stuff because I needed it for work, like my badge, my laptop, stuff like that. And I had to go into the apartment. And before I went in, he stopped me in the hallway and he looked me in the face and said, are you sure you're ready for this? And I said, I'm not ready, but I have to do it. And he said, okay, well, give me a second. And he ran in the house and he opened every single closet door to make sure I could see inside of it before I went in. And then I was able to walk in, grab stuff. I just basically looked at the ground the whole time, grabbed things, and I ran out. And then we left. And then my Uncle Bobby and everybody had to basically go in and pack up our apartment. Because I couldn't go in again. <laughs> but it's, it's the little things that people do. They don't realize that they help me in certain ways. Um, just the simple things of opening closet doors. Some people think it's really minuscule, but in my case, it's not. Or if we're going through somewhere and they see something that could trigger me, they'll warn me ahead of time. Say, like, when we go around this corner, I just want to let you know these people have a decoration up for Halloween and it's someone hanging from a tree. And they'll kind of, like, distract me when we're walking past it or they'll just be like, okay, it's coming up, look away. So I don't look at it. So it helps. And I think a lot of things is, um, recently I've been kind of trying to fill this void that I've had in my heart for a while of wanting to know there's something after I die to go to, something to look forward to. So I've been researching and I've turned to like the LDS religion and started going to church and I'm reading the Bible and it's kind of helping a little bit knowing that I have that love there that's behind me and it's helping a little bit. So usually if I'm having a dark, a uh, hard moment or whatever, I'll go sit in my room in the quiet and I'll read the Bible or I'll just sit there quietly and kind of pray in my head and it helps and go get, I get blessings at least once a week from my bishop and my elders. So it helps, <laughs> but I mean, that's pretty much it. I'd probably say, like I said, look for your resources. Um, usually when I have someone who's just recently gone through a traumatic event or who has mentioned that they're suicidal or anything of that sort, I'll immediately offer my phone number and say, no matter what time it is, call me. I'll always answer my phone and I'll listen. Because sometimes you just need someone to just listen to you vent and not someone to sit and interject their opinions on the matter or anything like that. Just someone to kind of agree with you and say, yeah, I understand, or okay. Not, well, if you would have done this, because that just bothers us so much. <laughs> but um, yeah, I'd seek out your resources. Don't try and handle it on your own because you're not gonna get anywhere but down. I know I tried a lot when I was in high school to handle things by myself. My parents didn't even know of any of my attempts until about a year before my dad committed suicide. And I finally had a mental breakdown and started crying and I explained everything to them. And they were completely shocked because they didn't know. But <clears throat> if you look back at anybody who's ever been suicidal, they're always the happy-go-lucky people that are willing to joke or lighten up a situation or do anything to make anybody else smile. But on the inside, they're falling apart and they just don't see a way out. So, I mean, if you're suicidal, seek out your resources, find someone who's willing to listen, um, find someone who's willing, even if you just need a hug, whether it's a complete stranger or not, hugs heal a lot of things, surprisingly. I didn't find that out until after my dad passed away, but some days I wake up and I just, I crave a hug from one specific person and it's my little brother's mom and she lives all the way in Springville but I'll make the drive because I just want a hug because it's that comforting feeling of knowing someone's there just to be there for you but yeah if you're down and you feel like there's nowhere else to go seek out help don't 
try and fix it yourself because you're not going to be able to fix it. It's not something you can just say, oh, I just need more sleep or, oh, I'm just extremely stressed out. If you're having thoughts of suicide, obviously you're, you're past that point and don't let it get any further. Seek out help, whether it's from your family doctor or suicide groups. Because I know with certain friends I've had, they're, they've said that they've had suicide thoughts or they self-harm. And they'll come to my suicide support group and just see how much it hurts the people around them that have lost someone. And it'll open their eyes to a lot of things because when you get to that point where nothing else matters, no one, you don't think of anybody else around you. You just think of yourself and what you can do to make it stop. And that's when suicide happens. So, yeah, seek out help. I would encourage anybody. And I know personally, once I'm back on my feet, I want to petition to have uh, police officers and EMTs, all of them, to go through certain training to understand how to handle someone who's suicidal or someone who's just lost someone to suicide. Because there's a very common situation with anybody who's lost someone to suicide where they've had a very negative experience with the cops. And they just, they don't know how to handle a situation of that sort. Because it's basically cut and dry, something had to have happened and there's someone behind it. But there's not always someone behind it. So. That's what I strive for in the future is kind of putting that out there that we need more help because it's not just people like me who've lost someone to suicide, but even our veterans. There's only one suicide uh, support center for veterans, like a call center, a 24-hour call center. There's only one in the United States, and I think that's pathetic <laughs> for everything they've done for our country, and no one's there to help them. Because my boyfriend's a veteran, he's of the special forces, and he's seen a lot. He st suffers from PTSD, and there's no help for him. The VA won't help or anything like that, so we just kind of have to do it ourselves. And that's where the deep end story comes in, because it's like someone throwing us in the deep end of the pool and saying, okay, figure it out. Like, you don't know how to swim? Well, you better learn to make it day by day. But there's a lot more people out there nowadays that are willing to help and listen. You just have to look them out, whether it's Googling someone's name or finding someone with a common interest that can point you in the right direction. But always seek out help. Don't try to fix it yourself because <laughs> it's not going to work. <laughs> it's a lot bigger of a statistic than I thought it was. Like before I lost my dad, I didn't even think of it as something that was an issue. I just thought I was alone in the situation and no one would miss me type thing. But then going to the groups and finding out at least once every meeting we have a new person coming in because they've lost someone. And starting new jobs, for some reason I attract those people to me that just like they need help or they've recently lost someone. and bring them in with open arms, but it's it's a lot bigger of a problem than I think anybody wants to shine a light on. It's an epidemic nowadays. It's, it's sad to think that there's kids that are not even in third or fourth grade that are committing suicide because of bullying or the mental illnesses that people go through. There's not enough resources, so they think that's their only option. And it's sad. <laughs> but I'm hoping, this is why I do things like this, where I can kind of enlighten people and let them know you're not alone out there. I mean, there's always someone that's willing to talk to you. You just have to find them and search for them. Don't give up on yourself or give up on other people. As low as humanity has kind of shined their light lately. <laughs> There's always someone out there that's willing to help you no matter what. I probably just have to give a shout out to the Heart and Soul Suicide Group if anybody needs help. Like I said, we're every second Tuesday from 
7 p.m. to 9 p.m. in the Women's Center here in Provo at the IHC. We're welcome to come, whether you've lost someone or not. If you just need some insight, you're more than welcome to come listen. We basically just sit around in a circle and we explain how we're feeling that week. It's kind of like an Alcoholics Anonymous, but for suicide. <laughs> so, I mean, I've made a lot of great friends. They're like my second family now. I think at least once a night I talk to people and they'll say, I hope you have a good night. I love you. And it's just, it's good to know I have those people. But yeah, if you, if you need help or you want someone to talk to, you're more than welcome to come. Uh, if you can't make it to the Provo one, we have the one in Payson, which is the same time, 7 to 9 p.m. at the Payson Hospital in the Women's Center. But we're pretty open to anybody that wants to come. We'd love for people to come just so they know that they're not alone. So, I guess it's something you'd have to kind of look at for your state. Um, I know just within this state, at least every county has one. Because I know there's one in Ogden, because I've been looking into that one. There's one in Salt Lake, one in Draper, and then the ones down here. So, I mean, it's just, if you just Google suicide support group, it'll pop up with so many different options. And most pa most pages, <clears throat> like I know there's one called NAMI. I don't remember what it means. It's something, National Association for Mental Illness, I think. If you go on their website, I think they have, they have a lot of resources you can go to, too. And you can search by, like, states, and there's always groups out there. Because there's a lot of people out there suffering, and they just need somewhere to go. But don't necessarily have the direction to go to <laughs> it's free of charge where you just come show up we gourd ourselves in candy and water and cookies <laughs> and cry <laughs> but it helps so at least twice a month I know that I can get the heavy weight off my shoulders that I'm suffering and express everything and then I leave just happy as can be because it's a lot of weight that I carry around every day and it's just gone now when I go and talk to them because I can just kind of spill it all out on the table and they just completely understand but they also have a, they have a lot of resources they've got books you can read uh, we have actually have a woman in our group her name's Wendy she wrote a book um, I can't remember what it's called I have it at home Basically, she's explaining her whole situation and what she went through. She wrote a book. It's on, like, the national publisher's list, and it's, like, number 11, I think, at Barnes & Noble. So there's a lot of different things, and if you, I mean, at least with ours, you can, I found ours through Facebook, honestly. I just looked up Suicide Support Group, and they popped up, and just being associated with them. There's a lot of other activities, like we do a walk once a year where we walk around holding pictures of our loved ones, or there's candle lightings and stuff, moments of silence, or we black out our Facebooks, and we just log off basically for like two days to give quiet and kind of escape from the social media world that brings a lot of hurt around, cause that's that's a whole nother topic. <laughs> so <laughs> probably my message to anybody that's gonna bully someone is it's not worth it because you don't know what that person's going through at home or what they're going through in their personal life. Because what you know is what you see when you're around them. So if you're making fun of someone for the way they look or the clothes that they wear like, if their clothes aren't name brand, it could be because they're struggling at home. There's money issues at home, and it's stressful, and they're doing the best they can. Um, or, like me with my face, I can't control it. It's just something that happened, but it has brought me down my whole life. Um, it's affected my eyesight, and I'm always wearing glasses, which is another thing I got bullied on, being called four eyes all the time. But, I mean, you just, you don't understand what people are going on, going, what's going on at home. Because what's going on at home could be completely 
devastating and they're your only escape from what's going on at home is to go to school or go hang out with your friends and when you go to school and you're being tormented there too it's it just pushes people over the edge someone can only take so much before they snap or the human body is not like the mind is not made to take everything and like it's a grain of sand it's we take everything and we calculate it in our heads and everybody thinks of things differently but I would just keep in mind you don't know what's going on and it's not worth it in the end because you make fun of that one person for being a nerd or for actually doing their schoolwork and then down the road surprise they're Bill Gates or someone who's making tons of money and you have to look back at it and go, wow, if I was their friend, I would be hanging out with them right now. But instead, I made the choice to make fun of them for actually doing their homework or for anything of that sort. Or I made fun of them for what they wear. Now they're a famous fashion designer. Or, I mean, it pushes a lot of people, but in my case with the depression and suicidal thoughts, when I would leave home, going through the stress of everything going on at home with the fighting and dealing with the separation issues from my biological father and just my life was stressful and my escape was going to school and going to history class because it was my favorite thing ever but I had one person in that history class that would constantly make fun of me and I grew to hate it. Now I don't remember anything from history class other than that one person and how much they made my life horrible. Um, I know through junior high I was bullied along with my friends. We were always bullied because we dressed weird because we were the gothic kids and they would make up stupid rumors about us and start different stories but I remember there was one kid there he would send me home crying almost every single day because he would make me feel horrible about myself. But now he's getting married on Halloween and I'm his wife's best or I'm his wife's maid of honor and we're best friends now because we put aside our differences. And he apologized cuz he realized how much I've been through and he felt horrible as a person for what he did and how horrible he made my life. So I mean there's always a positive outcome in any situation, but yeah, I mean, you just have to kind of take it upon yourself to realize there's more than just what you see on the outside. There's a lot that could be going in on, uh, on, on the inside, what could be going on in someone's head. So it's just, it's not worth it at all to sit and make fun of people or pick on them for the way they look because they could turn out to be completely someone completely different and then you're going to be kicking yourself because <laughs> you lost out on that friendship and then when you need something they're not going to be there so